Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, machaba, ciao, bonjour, namaste, jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jedley. Welcome to Reading with Your Kids. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so, so happy and so very honored that you'll join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. We do that by sharing fun, thoughtful, and thought-provoking conversations with fascinating people who just happen to be writing books for kids of all ages. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Tell your kids' teachers, their principals, their librarians, youth pastors, and let them know that they can hear us on the WREB AM FM 24-7 radio network, and they can find us and subscribe to us on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Good Pods, Podcast Addict, wherever you find your favorite shows. We have two wonderful guests for you today on this Easter Sunday. Matthew Paul Turner is joining us to celebrate You Will Always Belong. And later in the show, we will be listening back to an interview we had with Mitali Perkins celebrating her book, Bear Tree and Little Wind. You've heard the whispers. You've seen it on TV. You may have even seen the movie. Now it's time to bring Dungeons and Dragons directly to you with D and D for Hire. More than just a game, D and D lets you step into the role of a hero you create and guide them on fantastical adventures with your friends. Perfect for beginners and experts alike, D and D for Hire is sure to delight and entertain your kids for weeks on end. Such a fun game. There are endless possibilities. There's so many things that you can do. It's so much fun. Our son Eli loves D and D. It's like his favorite thing to do all week. I was like 15 when I joined. I'm 21 now. There are people who are in our party. Really learn to come out of their shells. Whether you're near or far. Whether you're looking for a birthday party or a campaign to keep you adventuring for years to come, D&D for Hire has you covered. Learn more at dndforhire.com. That's dndforhire.com. D&D for Hire, bringing the adventure to you. D&D for Hire runs games digitally over Zoom or in person in select areas. This episode of the Reading With You Kids podcast is brought to you by Lucas and the Game of Chance, a thrilling middle grade novel written by Anthony L. Mena. It is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read. While Lucas is playing his flute at the seawall one day, he befriends a mysterious talking dancing snake that rewards him with fortune and favor. Some years later, tempted by greed and pride, Lucas loses all of his riches and his family. He now must set off on a treacherous journey through a frightening forest filled with suspense and strange creatures to find destiny. Her son, Ilion, the sun, her daughter, Luna, the moon. These celestial guardians will surely allow him to reverse his misfortune, restore his honor, and win back all that he loves and treasures. Won't they? This is a reimagined Greek folk tale, Lucas in the Game of Chance. It's illuminated with dramatic and evocative pen and ink drawings that provide an ideal backdrop for the dark intrigue that fills this haunting story of human struggle, courage, and resilience. You and your kids are going to love it. Lucas and the Game of Chance by Anthony Almana. It is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by the books by Robert Provan, Sammy and Scarlet's Mangrove Adventure, and Sammy and Scarlet's Coral Reef Adventure. The first book in the series, Mangrove Adventure, recounts the tale of two young fish who live in a tidal pool in the Florida Keys. Sammy is a sergeant major fish, and Scarlet is a yellow-tailed snapper. They are different species from one another, and they don't look anything alike. But despite this, they become best of friends. They learn that it's not the color of a fish's scales that matters, but rather whether or not they have a loving heart. Sammy and Scarlet's Coral Reef Adventure is the second book in the series and tells the story of Sammy and Scarlet's continuing journey from the shelter of the mangrove forest in search of their adult home on the coral reef. 
The two fish are befriended along the way by Howie, the hawkbill sea turtle, who helps them through the dangers they will face ahead. Together, the three explore the amazing underwater city that is a coral reef. You and your family are going to love these books. Check them out today. The Books by Robert Provan. Join us right now from Nashville and the great state of Tennessee. Our guest is returning to the show to celebrate a book. I just am in love with the title. It's called You Will Always Belong. Please welcome back to the show, Matthew Paul Turner. Hey, Matt, how are you? Hello, how are you? It's good to be back. I am excited to have you back on. We've had such great conversations. Um, I think the last time we were talking about a book that you finished for a friend. Yeah, uh, What Is God Like? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, that that was such a, a powerful thing to to do for my friend who had passed away um, suddenly and in a surprise, uh, as a surprise. And I uh, was asked to, to finish her book. And um, I, and in fact, I, she had three book ideas and I just finished the second one. And so that one comes out next year. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. I, we talked a, a little bit about, um, you know, what that was like, you know, writing for your friend, completing her work. And mm-hmm. this, this is going to sound like a weird question, but do you feel even closer to her now than you did before she died? Because you've been spending oh, so my, much time my, in her space. Absolutely. You know, there, was, um, there were moments during that process of writing it because I was – I just – I mean, she is one of those people. Her name is Rachel Held Evans, and she was, she is so well loved by the community of people who read her work. And so I just felt like I was, um, I was a conduit. Like I, there were times when I felt like I was, I, I mean, you know, I felt I was speaking on her behalf. Like I mean, just. You know, like you feel one with her in the sense of just that writing process. And, you know, um, yeah, it was kind of like I was channeling her yeah. at times. So yeah. I, uh, I definitely, I took it, I took it very seriously. And, and, you know, it, like doing that was such a healing, uh, such a gift of healing for me. Like, because I, I mean, the grief process for losing, somebody like Rachel in your story was, um, was, was unlike any kind of grief story that I had ever encountered. Um, it was, it was hard. And, and so I, that, that book, finishing that first book was a, was a gift. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the new book. You will always belong. I'm, yeah. I'm guessing you're kind of, um, speaking on behalf of, uh, God. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I'm I'm speaking on behalf of. Uh, I mean, yes. I, there. I mean, God is God's in this book um, because there's a part where it says to uh, to God you belong. Um, but I I really feel like this is uh, this is me uh, a a message to all children, wanting them to know that belonging begins with themselves. Like you belong to our, we belong to ourselves, that this body is mine, these hands are mine, um, this mind is mine. And when we are, when we show up fully, when we uh, fully lean into this idea of belonging to ourselves, it allows us the gift of belonging to others. It allows us to fully show up. And, um, and what I love about it is that it's also belonging can become a gift that you give somebody else. Mm. Because when we share our story, when we share who we are and what and, and what we do, it it allows somebody else the opportunity to possibly share as well. And so belonging happens when those two things occur. And so like the book starts out, you belong, you do. That's always been true. You've belonged to yourself since you were tiny and new. And so uh, it's this, uh, this idea that belonging is one of those words that sounds really pretty, but so many of us don't fully c- 
comprehend what it means and more importantly, how to access the concept of belonging because we are, you know, so many of us are, you know, coming out of the pandemic, especially, you know, in the last few years, we've, we, there's a lot of people who feel a lot of loneliness right now. Um, there's a lot of people who feel sort of like marginalized in, or pushed into corners. And, and so this book is a, is, a, is hopefully will help them feel seen and give and empower them to know that they have their own belonging um, and how that plays out into their belonging to all that happens in our world. It's such a powerful and important lesson. Um, we can't expect others to love us and to accept us if we can't accept ourselves. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like it, it, I sometimes will just refer back to what Jesus said. Um, you know, love thy, love thy neighbor as thyself. And a pastor friend always, his joke is, is that most of us do. And it, which is kind of this idea that, you know, we don't love ourselves. So we don't all, we don't always know how to love others well. Mm -hmm. And so when we do love ourselves, we are, we, we learn what it means to love, uh, love other people and to show up in other people's stories. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the pandemic and how we were separated and, you know, and, and one of the really early on in the pandemic, I remember um, going out and the postman was coming and I thought, oh, you know, walk out, meet him, you know, and so you can save him a few steps. And this postman that had, had known me for years and was always friendly just snapped at me and he said, stay back. I don't want to die. And it was, oh. and it was at that moment I realized, wow, we are terrified of each we are other. Terrified. We are it, terrified. Yep. It, it, and fear is one of those things that seeps into our everyday stories. And it has a, an enormous, wild impact on how we interact with ourselves and how we interact with our, each other. Um, and it, it prevents us from going out and connecting with other people. Mm -hmm. And I think we all got in, you know, all of us got into this habit of just like, you know, distance and safety and, you know, uh, being alone. Um, and I think that I, I think that, you know, we will, it'll be years before we fully know the impact of that season in our story. Yeah. Um, because it will, I think it, it will, it will affect our kids in ways we don't under, we don't fully comprehend. And by the time we know the full impact, we'll probably not, we'll probably, ah, that's probably not even, <laughs> we won't even believe it. <laughs> well, I hope one thing that we will remember is just how, much we need each other. Yeah. You know, because and we do. you know, the, the, the idea of separating and being distant from each other, it came, I'm assuming it came from a good place of mm -hmm. trying to protect each other and keep each other sure. safe. But man, I mean, I, but even, even things that are, that come from good places, there needs to be a time when, you know, uh, those things are set aside in, you know, for, for, for connecting again and mm -hmm. for community and for, you know, doing things for other people. And I think mo for the most part, I think lots of us, you know, um, we've, we've come out of the, we've come out of those habits and we've let those things go. But I just think that we have gotten, so, some of us have gotten used to being alone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we are, you, you know, the, the, the statistics on loneliness is they're, they're through the roof right now um in in so many areas and so i think that this idea of belonging um i'm hopeful that it uh encourages kids to not only embrace their own belonging you know and for themselves but also to look around and to see who is who is alone and 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 maybe like reach out that reach out and 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 do something for someone else mm -hmm. Um, I'm constantly telling my, you know, reminding my own kids, like, you know, just keep your eyes open, y'all. Like, keep your, yeah, just l look around the lunchroom at school and just see about, um, look for those people who don't have this huge group of people around them. Invite them into your story. Let them be a part of, 
of things. Give give them give them that gift. Um, you never know what surprise what you what kind of surprise you might get. Um, and you know, and if they say no, then honor that, and it's that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that was a lesson that I shared with my kids, and it was a lesson. Something that 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 occurred to me uh, for many years, I in my my educational magic shows had an anti bullying theme, and initially, you know, it came from the schools. Hey, can you help us with this? And initially, it was all about hey, say no to bullying and and, and all that kind of stuff. But then I realized that a much better way to create a school where everybody felt safe and where bullies weren't happening or hurting other people was to create a school where everybody felt like they belonged. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that, and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, and that's, uh, you know, it's some, but it has to be intentional. It has to be something that is put um, at the forefront of, you know, the, uh, uh, an organization's, mission mm-hmm. because like if it's not at the forefront like you you, you don't because they have it, there has to be intentional things that happen in 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 a school's um just environment to ensure that everybody feels safe feels at home feels alive feels you know um able to be them be themselves and um you know and I think that, you know, it's one of those things that I, 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 as this book has, you know, been out for a week or two now, um, I've gotten lots of commentary about adults mm-hmm. needing, ha- needing this message, mm-hmm. how it has been become a, a, a book that they see it as like this healing process for their inner child. You know, when, when like so many uh, people who are, you know, trying to, um, stay mentally and emotionally healthy they do inner child work and they realize that they have trauma or they realize they have you know uh just uh, things that they've uh, not dealt with in their childhood and so it, this book is a uh, has you know become a reminder for them that they also belong yeah. that they also belong to themselves and so when they show up for themselves they that's when they are able to to really show up for their kids and really show up for their families and show up for the people in their stories. And so it, um, it's, it's, it's always wild to, 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 to be reminded how children's books show up in people's stories, and whether they are children or whether they're parents or whether they're adults. It's, um, you know, children's books or picture books just have a, they feel safe. They feel they don't, they they come into somebody's experience and without pretension, and it's just a lovely thing to uh, engage. Yeah, yeah, I you know we've talked a lot here in the podcast about the fact that adults, you know, there's so many benefits kids get from having their parents and their grandparents and their caregivers read to them and read with them. I think there are also incredible things that we get as adults as we are reading. And one of them are the messages that we find in books like yeah. You Will Always Belong. Yeah, absolutely. And I just think that it, 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 what I love about the, those moments when I'm reading to my kid is that it, I get to hear them laugh. I get to hear them ask questions. They get to hear me interact with the story. They get to ask me questions. And so it's just a, this, this little, this book creates this, this, this moment of just really beautiful community between you and your child. Um, and they feel safe and they feel loved and they feel close to you. Um, and it's, you know, and sometimes it becomes about the book and sometimes it's just about the moment and, and the experience. Hey, I don't know if I ever asked you, when did you realize that God wanted you to be and, and lead this ministry of yours, of, of delivering his message through children's books? You know, um, it, was, it was something that I uh, started doing or started pursuing shortly after uh, my ex-wife and I had children. Um, because I wanted, I had, I had a pretty, uh, 
a pretty rough upbringing within a church. Like I, I had Barbies burned in front of me to explain hell. That was the kind of church I was raised in. And, and so, and so I, while I certainly was raised in an extreme version of church, I do know that lots of the things that I experienced as a kid in church, learning about God are, are, are just sort of like, um, really big, ugly moments that other people really experienced as well, learning about God. They, you know, they learn ideas that, that they're not good, or they learn ideas that, um, yes, God loves them, but God also, you know, kn knows that you're a, a terrible sinner and like, and all those things. And so anyway, I wanted to re I wanted to get my kids to have an introduction to God that was healthy and happy, that wouldn't turn into something that they'd have to recover from years down the road. And so that's when I just started to, put, to, to start putting words down on paper. And it took years for a publisher to give me a chance. <laughs> um, and they finally did. And that, that's when God, when God Made You came out. And so it, um, it's been really lovely to be a part of uh, a movement of, you know, the, it seems to be a, pr a pretty big movement of people just wanting their kids to have a healthy, happy, good introduction to God. One that is, um, one that talks about God delighting mm -hmm. in, in, in the people he created and the people that, um, the people that God loves. And so like, I think that we talk about God loving us, but then we, there's this caveat. It's almost like we put an asterisk next to God's name, <laughs> you know, down below where it says, oh, by the way, <laughs> yes, God loves us, but, you know, and there's a whole bunch of buts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you remind me, um, another friend who's a fellow Nashvillian, is that how oh. you say that? Um, yeah. Phil, Phil Joel, who uh, talks in his concerts about God delighting in us, that God sees us in is delighted, and that's like that word we we kind of use. But when you think about it, it's like, wow! Like God, I'm making God. Ha he's looking down at me, and it, he's yeah. like smiling, like like right. God. I remember one of my books is one of my books pointed out that idea that um, I, it, th th this was my my book called I Am God's Dream, and it one of the lines is I am one of the billions of reasons God smiles. And I think that is just a, a beautiful thing because I believe that that every kid, every human, that God, that you you bring a smile to God's face. Yeah, yeah. And that's a powerful thing for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, you, you know, uh, the words that were going to come out of my mouth is that's such a great message to share with kids, but it's a really great message to share with somebody like me who's almost a hundred. <laughs> I, I, you're not quite a hundred, but yeah, I get it. The, you know, uh, I remember there, I, I, I was, there was a story one time of, um, a pastor friend of mine who she works as a, she does some hospice work in, it was, it, I think Vermont, Vermont or New Hampshire. I can't remember, but one of those two places. And she was, uh, helping, uh, a 99 year old woman. Uh, leave this earth and it was she was like they were they were in that last week and for some reason one of uh, my first book when god made you was sitting at that woman's bedside table and she patted it and the pastor ended up reading my book to this woman three different times during that week and i you know and i thought to myself i never in a million years did i think that book would find its way into that kind of a scenario. That was not my intention. I had, but that's the beauty of words and that's the beauty of picture books. They, it, they often can transcend what we thought they were for. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, you know, I, I laugh about this idea of, you know, that for some reason that, that woman wanted to hear the idea of God making her. And God delighting in who she was and yeah. who she is, um, and so it was a that that it was a beautiful thing. Yeah, 
Well, you know, it makes sense because we're constantly told that we're not good enough, that yeah. we need this these set of clothes or this car. We need to eat this kind of food, and um, uh, we're not, you know, we're, we're we're not good enough to get into this school. And there's right. so many, and we tell ourselves that. Mm-hmm. We're like, like you know, we we've become so used to living up to this this idea of what we think we're all supposed to be that we are very we, like the self talk that we have going on in our brain so often is just negativity. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, it's just something that, you know, if you were this, you'd, you, you'd be successful, or if you could do this, you'd finally, you know, whatever. And so like, I, I think that it's, it, yes, we get those words from other people for sure, but we also get those words from ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We, what was your reaction when you heard that pastor tell you that this woman wanted to hear your book the, in the last moments of her life. I, I, I was it, like, it was almost sort of like, wow. Like, I mean, it was just kind of this wow moment because a wow moment, because I, again, like I said, I never in a million years did I even think that that was a thing. And so to know that that, person wanted my book read like it's just a powerful because usually I'm, I'm 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 used to being a part of people's stories at the beginning of their life mm-hmm. you know um and to to find out that this woman wanted to be a small part of her like passing on um it was, it was powerful and so like i i you know i'm just grateful that god was able to that got that that God used my story, that you, my little storybook, to bring that woman joy. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. What a great message! Hey, you know, I, I'm, I, I just want to plant this seed. Maybe the next time you'll come on, uh, you were talking about us being afraid early in the in our conversation today, and so many kids are are afraid. And one of the things that I'm always reminded of is that. Throughout the Bible, Jesus is constantly telling us to not be afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And I think that, you know, another way of saying that is be brave. Yeah. Be strong. Keep going. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's the beauty of, that, of Jesus' message is that is, it's not about fear. That it's not, you know, faith and fear are like, almost opposites um and that we should you know if when belief is a part of our story it should give us hope it should make us love more it should empower us to to take those steps forward and uh experience belonging in a lot of ways yeah absolutely well we want to encourage everybody out there to stop burning barbie dolls to (laughs) <laughs> hopefully that's no no one's doing that <laughs> I, I, I i have very vivid memory, memories of a priest screaming at a homily when i was growing up and like not yeah. not digging that at all but it, which was why when i really i really came to embrace my faith when i went to a jesuit high school and the message was that god loves us mm-hmm. first and foremost, and and I'm like, cool, I can yeah. I can dig that. And it's and God doesn't just love us because God has to love us. God want like God is like wants to lavish that love on us. Like God delights and is exuberant and excited that we get to go we, that we get up and that we're living our story. And so I think that those are the things that I just love to sit around and think about because I just know how much I love watching my kids mm-hmm. wake up in the morning and just the delight that I feel as a human. And I think that that, that it doesn't even compare to the delight that God feels when we wake up yeah. and, and, and to live yeah. and to experience the day. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I had – so much fun reading books like these with this kind of message with my kids. 
And, you know, we talk about, you know, going out and doing the voices and all that and being, you know, when we're reading, being animated. I am like, I know that if my kids are still five and seven years old and they were sitting on my lap and I was reading You Will Always Belong, I'd be screaming, you know, just, oh, you always belong. We'd be hugging. <laughs> yes. Ah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Well, where can we go to find out more about You Will Always Belong and find out more about you? You know, I am pretty much Matthew Paul Turner across the board. It's MatthewPaulTurner.com. I'm Matthew Paul Turner on Instagram, Facebook. So come and say hi. Awesome. We've had a really fun time speaking to the author of You Will Always Belong. Our guest has been Matthew Paul Turner. Hey, Matthew, thanks so much for being back with us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Junior Miles and the Junkman. Great middle grade novel written by Kevin Carey. Junior and his family live in a junkyard where his father creates pieces of art from the junk surrounding them. When Junior's father falls ill and dies, Junior and his mom are left with few resources other than what his mother brings home from her job as a waitress. The junkyard is threatened by encroaching development, and just when Junior thinks all is lost, he finds that a junk sculpture of a man gifted to him by his father begins to speak to him. The junk man provides advice in the form of enigmas. Are they clues, or is it just nonsense? Junior and his best friend Isaac embark on a journey to find out. Can a man made of junk parts teach Junior about art and friendship and overcoming the loss of a loved one? Only if Junior believes it can. This is a really wonderful middle grade novel. You and your kids would love it. Check it out today. Junior Miles and the Junk Man by Kevin Carey. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Facing the Beast Within. Written by New York Times best-selling author Mark Sheverton. Cameron Poole has a problem, a big problem. He's a bully magnet who struggles with anxiety. Being the smallest sixth grader at his summer camp, everything around him triggers his anxiety. He's beast, making it impossible for him to do the same things other kids can do. In a constant state of worry, Cameron feels like a perpetual failure. That's bad enough. But when Cameron learns that mythical monsters are trying to invade his camp, things go from bad to worse. You and your kids are going to love this exciting middle grade novel. It belongs in your family library. You're going to love it. Facing the Beast Within, written by Mark Sheverton. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Becoming Strong. By Ananda Moy Baker. Becoming Strong is an illustrated children's chapter book about an adorable little bee named Jazienza who has a bent antenna and must wear glasses. She gets bullied at times, and through the sage advice of Mama Queensy Bee, the Queen Bee, she learns to become strong, confident, and kind. The book not only helps children learn breathing techniques to deal with anxiety, but also enables them to connect on a deeper level with nature. In addition, a clear message in the book is that we are all important and valuable, and our lives have meaning no matter our size. Becoming Strong is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read and would be a fantastic addition to any family library. Join us right now from the Bay Area in the beautiful state of California. Our guest today is here to celebrate a beautiful story for the Holy Week. It's called Bear Tree and Little Wind. Please welcome to the show, Metali Perkins. Hey, Metali, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm excited to have you on. Let's jump right into it. What's Bear Tree and Little Wind all about? Well, Bear Tree and Little Wind is, I would say, an outsider's view of Holy Week. Uh, I it's It features two characters. One is Little Wind and the other is Bear Tree. And Little Wind is really seeing all the events of Holy Week from the outside and wondering what's going on. And it's really the faith of his friend, Bear Tree, that allows him to keep coming back and finding out who this quiet man coming in on a donkey is and 
Um, and then leading into her, her faith leads him into the future where she's waiting for his 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 return. Yeah. Now, if, for, for those of you who aren't Christian, the Holy Week refers to the Christian week leading up to the, the, the holiday of Easter. And it is a beautiful time with lots of different traditions. And the neat thing about it is that there are, uh, because there are so many different branches of Christianity, there are a lot of, of different traditions throughout those different branches, but also uh, a lot of different traditions because Christianity is worldwide, it's celebrated differently in different cultures in different countries. And um, it's, it's a beautiful time, and it's wonderful to kind of think that you're part of this beautiful worldwide family. Yes, that's so true. One of the things I love about this book is that for so long when I, uh, when I go to churches in the West, and, um, and even in other parts of the world, you still see like a very pale-skinned Jesus um, in art, and uh, and when you go to you know remote part of rural South Africa and you see this white faced Jesus, it's a little bit disconcerting because I don't think he was. I think he was very Middle Eastern looking. And so the illustrator Koale of this book, who's just I think she's a genius. She's based in Vietnam, and her her work with color is just incredibly gorgeous. She um, she made him look very Middle Eastern, and and Little Wind also because Little Wind is a a wind in the Middle East. He also has a cute little, a beautiful little Middle Eastern face. So I'm excited about presenting this, these renditions of of, uh, of Easter to, to the really to the global community. Yeah, and that's beautiful, and it makes perfect sense that Jesus looked Middle Eastern because that's where he was born. Right. <laughs> yes, we forget that with the blue-eyed Jesus on, on all the greeting cards. And, and I think there's nothing wrong with that because we like to see, you know, we like to see Jesus in in our own context. And, and so the art and everything that's been created for years is out of the European context. And I have absolutely nothing wrong with that. But but right now the church is widening and spreading and there's more growth in in areas that aren't, that have brown skin and mm -hmm. dark hair and so it's it's actually a good time for different renditions and different depictions of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, you know, uh, right at the beginning of, of the Bible, it says that we were created in the image of God. And I think that that's possibly why a lot of those European artists, uh, when they read that, they said, oh, the God looks like me, so that's what I'll paint. But I think the... <laughs> Now that we're more sophisticated and, and, and understand that the world is so diverse, maybe we can, when we hear those words, we can understand that God was talking about the fact that to look deeper, to look deeper, to see his image in all of us. That's right. We were made in God's image. God wasn't made in our image, exactly. right? So, exactly. Yeah, and it's, I, I did not hear anything about Holy Week or Jesus or uh, until I was in college because I grew up in another faith tradition. Mm -hmm. And so when I first heard about Jesus, I thought, well, that's for, you know, white people and black people. It's not for immigrants from India like me. So I didn't, even, I didn't know anything about the events of Holy Week. So that's why when I say that, I wrote this from an outsider's perspective. It really is hopefully a fresh take. I think a lot of people grow up, I mean, you grew up in the Catholic Church, so you grow up with beautiful traditions, but sometimes it just feels like it's your, you know, your, it was your childhood tradition. And so uh, when you didn't grow up with it, like I did, um, it's, there's a different way of seeing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying, uh, in this book, I'm hoping to offer that to the, to the, really to the church and to people outside the church, uh, an outsider's view of what happened that week in Jerusalem when there was so much turmoil and chaos. And, you know, we think of it as, you know, the Easter bunny and, um, a sweet time, but it really, the, the first week was truly a time of chaos and um, suffering and all kinds of global events were going on at that time. There was war between an insurrection and all kinds of things. So uh, that's what this, this book is not your Easter bunny version of Easter. This is more of a, of a, I don't know, like a intense, but beautiful look well, at it. I think that that's really important especially now, because we're going through a very intense upheaval in our own, in our own time here in the United States. There's, there's lots of unrest on both sides of, of you, the political table, and um, people are un, unhappy. 
and people are worried, and they're not quite sure what's going to happen, as I'm sure the apostles and, and the followers of Jesus were feeling in that, in that Holy Week. Uh, but there is a lot of hope that came out of Holy Week, a lot of beauty that came out of that uncertain time. Oh, yes, definitely. But it, it's, uh, it's interesting because um, the little wind is so confused because Bear Tree is so sure this is real king that's coming and that when real king comes, everything will be made right. Uh, and then little, but because I use these, these elements from, from creation, the wind and the tree, to sort of give it a broader sweep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm hoping that kids will be able to ask those questions as they read this book with their parents. Like, because I, I do include things like the burning of the temple by the Roman soldiers, uh, right after 70 years after Jesus, after Holy Week, there was this absolute scourging of you know, de- demolition of, of Jerusalem, which seems counterintuitive. If Jesus came to bring peace, as he did, then why was so much chaos and war come after he came? And, and, and as you said, we're still in those times. Mm-hmm. So for a child to be able to, in the safe circle of their parents' or grandparents' arms, to read the events of what actually happened in Holy Week and to ask the questions of why why is it getting burned and what's going to happen to Bear Tree? Is Bear Tree going to survive? And, oh, my goodness, little wind looks so scared there. And, oh, look, it's all burning. And then and then, um, and then, then at the end, of course, we end with the hope that as Bear Tree's seeds are scattered throughout the whole earth, that the hope of palm trees clapping their hands when Jesus comes back again the second time to restore peace and um and to bring the, the actual end of all war and chaos at that time yeah. so that's that's the sleeping look of, of creation at on the particular events of holy week yeah. so why don't we talk a little bit uh, just about a holy week for those that, that aren't familiar with it or you know have just heard this thing holy week um kind of share with us especially from somebody who chose to be part of this tradition as opposed to being born into it as i was Right. So it, it's, it really does start with that Palm Sunday where um, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. And, and in my book, Little Wind is thinking, is he going to come in on a stallion? Is he Because because the trees are, cla- are clapping their hands in excitement. The palm trees are so excited that real king is coming. And, and yet when, um, when we see Jesus approaching, he's, he's perched on a, on a donkey and there's a baby foal with uh, just quietly walking in to Jerusalem on this donkey, of course, fulfilling prophecy, but from the perspective of, of Little Wind, it's, that's not what he was expecting. He was expecting this big king to come roaring in on a stallion and make everything right. Um, and so that's the first Palm Sunday. And then uh, then we have the, the days of the week where Jesus, uh, with Monday Thursday, where he ate with his disciples, the Last Supper, then comes Good Friday. And, um, and we, there's every day in Holy Week has a, a particular memory associated with that week of Jesus' approach to the cross. And so we as in the church, we, we slow it down a little bit. We take our time as we welcome Jesus and we watch him come closer and closer to his destination, which isn't a throne yet. It's a cross. And so Saturday is, um, all, it all goes quiet because Good Friday he goes to the cross. But then, of course, we have Easter Sunday. And then I think in the Catholic tradition and the Orthodox tradition, uh, Monday is the day where you focus on when he's going to come back. Mm-hmm. And so that the book goes all the way to that point where um, we're looking forward to his returning as on the throne the next time, not on a donkey, not on a cross, but on the throne. Yeah. Mitali, if you don't mind, you, you shared with us that you came into the faith and you chose to be part of this faith. And I think that that is something um, – and again, I think most people are, are kind of born into their faith and the idea of conversion, whether it's to Catholicism or Christianity or to Islam or Buddhism. I, I think that that's foreign to a lot of people. It's a big step for lots of folks. What was it in your journey that inspired you to make that change, to make that conversion? Well, I, as I said, I was born in India, but we lived all over the world. And so I grew up seeing a lot of suffering in different parts of the world and hunger. And so I, when I got to college, I, I made it my vow that there would be no more hungry children on earth by the time I was done with, with my life. Uh, and yet still those questions of suffering and evil. Uh, my father taught us to believe in a creator God who 
created all the beauty of a butterfly and the symmetry and he had a, he had a beautiful face. But when I looked at the suffering, that didn't seem to make sense to me. How did, how does such a good and beautiful God who made all the beauty in the earth allow such horrible violence and suffering to uh, continue? And for people, how can he love us if we, if we continue to suffer? That was my big question. Um, and I was searching in all different faiths and all different philosophies through my college years. Um, I went to a fantastic college. I had the real, a real opportunity there to, to read widely and in the humanities and philosophy and in the religions. And so uh, I didn't consider reading. In fact, I, I was assigned to read the Bible my first freshman year of humanities. And I opened the Genesis, book of Genesis, and I read about these two naked people in a garden with a, some fruit tree. And I thought, what is this? I had no idea. So, you know, you have to, you can return your textbooks to the library to get your money back after you, so I was, I thought, I'll just get 70% back and return this Bible. I'll never read it again. Uh, and then uh, in my junior year, a friend of mine uh, gave me the book, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And I had grown up reading the Chronicles of Narnia, but of course not associating Aslan with Jesus in any way, because I didn't know anything about Jesus. Mm-hmm. So when, but I did trust C.S. Lewis. So I took the book with me. To, I studied my third year in Vienna, Austria, and um, I took the book with me and I, in the New Testament. And I, t- I promised my friend I'd read it. And of course, I don't know if you've ever been to Vienna, but it is it has got some of the most beautiful cathedrals in the world. And so it was winter, the snowing, and I would go into these cathedrals and I would look at the art, and there would be a lot of art um, about from the Bible, but mostly there would be this cross and there would be this man on the cross at the front, the suffering man on the cross in the front of every one of those cathedrals. And I began to wonder, what, who is this man? What is happening? I mean, I knew generally who Jesus was, but nothing specific. So I read, started reading the gospels and I, I read it very slowly during that time. And I got to the part where Jesus, this very thing we were talking about was approaching the cross. And by then I could knew that he wasn't, you know, white man's God. I could tell he had a lot of the same values of you know, hospitality and the way he welcomed people and children that come from my culture of origin. So by then I was feeling very much uh, astounded by his Middle Eastern sort of way. And then when he kept, when he went to the cross and he took the cross, he took it, took, he went to the cross, he submitted to it. For me, that was the first time at the intersection of a suffering God who loves us made any sense at all because he himself took that suffering the, the worst the world can pour out poured out on him and yet he still loved so that's when i thought this this is more than a man this person is of course the resurrection with uh which to me seems very viable because every single one of his followers went to their death mm-hmm. proclaiming that they'd seen him again so at that point i didn't know anything about the church anything i just thought wow i'll take it i was from a hindu tradition so i said I'll take Jesus as my guru. This will be great. And uh, I won't have to tell anybody. And so, uh, but of course, people were praying for me and I didn't know it. And so when I got back to this, this, my college, there uh, there was a baptism, a chance to get baptized. And so when I was baptized, uh, it was really a life-changing moment for me. And then I, I grew in my faith and I learned about the wider traditions. I learned about the Catholic Church and um, just so much uh, that that has changed in my life. And Sort of like that little yeast, that little seed that has permeated my life through these years. That was a long time ago. I was only 19. So, and of course, I'm only 21 now, Dad. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it was yeah, a long right. two years ago. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot happened in those decades, a lot. So uh, I'm very grateful. And my, my sister also became a follower of Jesus. And then before my father passed, he saw a dream. He had a dream. And... Uh, he also received Jesus as his savior, and my mother three years ago requested to be baptized. So uh, my entire family of origin, except for one, so one sister, is um, now in the church. So it's kind of amazing. I didn't say much or do much, but I think just that was God's gift to me. That's wonderful. Y- you know, we hear so much negative you know, associated with the church, especially lately with different scandals and whatnot. And we hear a lot of people who are pounding on the Bible, telling you that this person will be condemned and that person will be condemned and the hate. And sometimes you sit back and say, wait a minute, I thought this guy Jesus was all about love. I don't, I'm not feeling a lot of love coming from you guys. 
Uh, but I think if we can look past the noise, and I think that's one thing, maybe that's one of the reasons Jesus came in to Holy Week on that donkey, to let us know, to look beyond the noise. The noise is all noise, that the real message can be found within us, within these moments where people are together in, in, in breaking bread with each other and, and you know, spending time in communion with each other, communicating with each other. Yeah, and in the book, in Bear Tree and Little Wind, I, I introduced you as uh, Little Wind calls him the quiet man. You were talking about how he entered such a world of noise quietly. Um, and I think that's because our world, the antidote to all the shouting in our world has to be a quiet man, right? There, if a shouting man came in, it would just more cacophony. But um, but because he came in so quietly and so lovingly, this, there, Koa drew pictures of him washing his disciples' feet, of him with the children. Um, and I think hopefully as children read the book, they'll they'll sense that something powerful is happening as this quiet man came into the world, that the whole world, all of creation, is no longer going to be the same because he quietly entered. I think as I'm listening, and I just received my copy of Bear Tree and Little Wind earlier today, and I haven't had a chance to to look at it. But as you're talking about your depiction of Jesus, I'm imagining my kids when they were five and seven years old really wanting to be friends with that Jesus. Yes, I think that's right. But I, I also took a little bit of a step back because I wanted the child to be to see themselves in Little Wind, who is this adorable. She personified this this wind. Um, you know, the Bible says he makes the winds his messengers, and so this beautiful personified little wind comes in. And I'm hoping the child will be able to see themselves in that wind, asking the questions of who is this man and. What, where is he going? What's happening to him? And, and so a parent can gently lead a child because for a child, Holy Week is as new as it was to me. Uh, it's not all jaded and tarnished with Bible thumping people the way that it is for an adult. And so I'm hoping that those questions of faith, like why, given that Jerusalem was destroyed and all the palm trees burned, why is this one palm tree saying, no, I still believe, I still believe. And so I'm hoping that, uh, that will be a way for them to introduce a child to uh, to all those big incidents and bring them into a sort of close look at what happened. I've written books for kids now for 25 years, 20, yeah, and I've, I've traveled around the world speaking to kids. I prefer kids to adults. I think adults are way overrated. So I was always, when I write a book for kids, I'm always thinking about those, those little eyes and little hands and I had two, we have two boys, and so I read aloud to them nonstop. And, uh, and when I wrote this book, I was trying, I was paying attention. We, we, Cole and I both paid attention to those little details that draw a child in and engage a child and, and help them to ask questions about what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I love that you want your book to be something that inspires kids to ask questions. I have this very vivid memory when my kids, um, we're in high school. They were very active in the church. And I remember one, uh, one of the people in our parish come up and say, oh, you must be so proud of your kids. They're, they're involved. And I see them up there on the altar. And, and it's so wonderful. And I'm so worried because my daughter's going to college next year. And that's when they start to question their faith. And that would be terrible. And I'm thinking, no, no, that's actually pretty good because our faith can stand up to questions. And if they can't, then you probably shouldn't believe in the faith right and i think when you get to the when you open the book and you see the panel where all of jerusalem is burning and koa drew up with red flames and and the scene of destruction and the soldiers and everybody looks so powerful for me it really speaks to this this age of, of as you said where there's these big events and children there's been a pandemic and uh, fires we have forest fires all over um California. And so when a child wonders why, where is God in the middle of that? Why are these things happening? I think there's room in this story to ask those questions. And and even for a parent not to have the answer, but to even to ask those questions together. You know, we as parents think we have to have the perfect theological answers, but um, to sit with a child with your arm around a child and to ask the questions of faith, I think is a very powerful part of 
both their spiritual formation and our formation as well. So yes, I love that you said that. Um, that's my hope that both adults and children will be able to ask questions of faith with this book. Yeah. And I love that you're encouraging parents to be able to say, I, I don't know. I, let's let's pray and ask God together and, and see what God tells us. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reading With Your Kids and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. This is where I usually ask you all to connect with us on social media, and we certainly would love for you to connect with us on social media, uh, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram and TikTok, at Jedly Magic on Twitter. But as this is being uh, first published on Easter Sunday, 2024, I just want to let you know that you are always in my prayers. And if you do have a prayer life, we hope that you keep us in your prayers as well. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our guests and all of our sponsors. I want to thank my amazing team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Chris Doherty, Skylar Strauss, Nick Warner, Kyoko Ito, Kayla Newland, Kristen Barrett, Sydney Swan, Hannah Rose. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place. And you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you on the next episode of Reading With Your Kids.